welcome everyone to our global healthcare educational series. Um, and uh, we've been, uh, so we're doing these quarterly um, and having really premier speakers uh, join us. And since the, the pandemic launched, it kind of turned to all virtual. When we first started this a couple of years ago, it was uh, really an in-person event. And I think uh, like everything during the pandemic, uh, life changes and some things are um, kind of really uh, fantastic uh, changes in our lives. Other things are obviously not so fantastic. I think this is, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit of doing these uh, online is we can actually invite, um, you know, more people to join from wherever they are. And I, and I think that's uh, one of the things. So hopefully we'll have a, a robust um, kind of audience today. And I I'm, I'm, want to do a couple reminders. Um, you know, the, uh, we can ask questions at any time. We, we don't have to wait and I'll introduce our um, esteemed speaker today and guest, honorary guest in a second. But you may uh, text questions at any time. You may wait towards towards the end. Um, and, and no question obviously is too simple or too complex. I think the ideal thing is for us to all to get smarter today and to learn uh, for the topic today is going to be really the Brazilian private sector. So um, it, Dr. Maureen uh, Lewis is our um, esteemed uh, guest. She is going to talk about innovations in Brazil's private sector. Now, you know, Maureen is a, uh, uh, first of all, she has nothing to disclose. I want to make that clear. And Eileen will put in uh, into the chat function that those of you who want to receive uh, credit for attending will have the information um, so that you can do that. So Ma Maureen is a co-founder and CEO of Accesso Global, and um, she is sort of a, uh, diplomat or a daughter of, a, of a, a living the diplomatic life and has lived in multiple countries. Uh, I feel, although not, I'm an Aramco brat, we weren't diplomats, but have that kind of U.S. expat um, bring that naturally into her work. And she's highly accomplished, having worked over 20 years at the World Bank. Um, and she's really been uh, an expert in different parts of the world, so not just Brazil. Uh, but having done really successful HIV and AIDS work uh, in Brazil, um, she's an expert in obviously health economics, has a PhD and, and uh, her doctorate from Johns Hopkins in, in economics. She's also um, has degrees from Georgetown University. Um, she brings a lot of experience. And I think what I had um, asked uh, Dr. Lewis to kind of uh, sort of educate on really is, is Brazil, her experience there, but also where they are today. and and. Who better than her also to put in the context of a global pandemic because she's also has a lot of experience in understanding the economic in impacts of epidemics and pandemics in the past. So really a, a multi-dimensional public health leader and health economist leader. So with that, Maureen, I want to hand it off to you and we're excited to um, hear what you have to say and also to uh, engage in the conversation. Thank you for joining us today. And you are muted, so you'll have to unmute uh, just as a reminder, because I do that all the time. Got it. I got it. Okay. Sorry. This is this has become this is Tanner. Stay here. This has become uh, an issue here. We so I think I thought we had it, but we don't. We'll get through the. Uh... All right. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be here, despite the electronic problems. And um, but I will. I, uh, this is an issue I feel very strongly about. I've worked I've worked in Brazil for probably thirty years now, and I'm still quite active. So I hope I can share some of this with all of you, and I welcome your questions. So I'm going to do a bit uh, a number of things here. One, I will talk about Brazil, compare it a little bit with the U.S tell you a little bit about the public health system because I think it's important in terms of understanding the private sector, then talk about the private sector, the range of providers and payers, talk about the major innovation innovators in the private sector and I'll talk about some of them um, and we can go back to that if need be. So um, Brazil is uh, a federal system. It's, got, it's basically the size of the continental US. It's got the most populous city in the Latin America in Sao Paulo. And it has a number of cities over the size of a million people. So it's got, it's got a number of, of things that are common uh, with the US. Uh, 
the population is sixth in the world, where so we have about um, a little over 100,000, 100 million people more than Brazil does. The GNP per capita is almost, uh, US is almost 10 times the size of Brazil. Um, and it's Brazil is very much concentrated in the southern part of the country, where Rio de Janeiro is and Sao Paulo and the big cities. Um, health expenditures, a percent of GDP is actually rather high for their income group. Uh, in the US, it's almost 17%. There, it's almost 10%. So private health expenditures as a percent of the total is actually quite high in Brazil. It's 58%. In the US, it's, um, this is backwards. So it's almost 50% 50% in the US. So in Brazil, although it's, it purports to have a public system that serves everyone, it really doesn't. Uh, and a lot of people pay. And the out-of-pocket payment is about 20, is over 27% of the total. Private health insurance cover, coverage is 23% compared to the US at 68, which is very different. The infant mortality rate is about twice the US rate, but fertility is about the same. So this gives you a sense of Brazil and where it fits relative to the US. So the public health system is broad, but it's quite fragmented. So it's called the Single Unified Health System, which is SUS. It's a federal program with funding allocated to municipalities of 5,000 or more, and it reimburses hospitals, not on a case mix basis, but on a fee-for-service basis. And municipal, and I will get to how else they, they have um, their transfers work. It covers all citizens. There are no co-pays. The national work of hospitals is largely funded by states and municipalities because like the US, it's a very federal country. With that many people, it needs to be. IT is underutilized and fragmented. There's no patient interface. Things are done in person. Primary health care uh, is a local government function with federal transfers and local and state funds supplementing it. And it's based on uh, a couple of things, freestanding primary care clinics, and then something that is the jewel in the crown, which is called the Family Health Care. It's an outreach program to communities with a team of services provided by that team that does prevention and monitors healthcare. The problem with it is it's not connected to the private healthcare clinics, it's not, con it's not connected with the hospitals, and so they're all separate and equal, if you will. So it sort of looks like this, right? You have your house of, of healthcare, and all the pieces are um, separate and they don't talk to each other. And that's true between public and private as well as just within public. So what's the private, private sector look like? So they run the gamut from very basic and informal to high quaternary care. Their best care is the best in Latin America, uh, rivals some of the, the, the um, very high end in the US, uh, uses a lot of, learns a lot from the US at those high end hospitals but I think there's, there's some shortcomings that we'll talk about. Um, and, but only 20%, 22% of, of spending goes to primary care overall. And it's mostly low in, income households, which is, makes it a very progressive system. But 45% of total spending is spent at medium and high complexity hospitals. So there's clearly a demand for this. There are a lot of small, low occupancy hospitals that make uh, that are poor quality and really undermine the efficiency of the system. And they too are very separate from all the other hospitals and all the other primary cares. So provider regulation for quality is a state and local fun function. They're rare, they're uneven, they're poorly done. Um, there's, licensing is optional, accreditation of facilities is optional. There are lots of options for uh, accreditation. Brazil has its own. Some people use JCI, some people, which is the Joint Commission International, which is very similar to what the US has, but probably maybe a notch below. But they're, they probably have the most number of JCI hospitals of any country. So there's some very good hospitals and very high-end hospitals. Um, but only 8% of private providers are accredited. So a lot of these small, poor hospitals also skew what, what's uh, going on. And in the end, there are, there are quality issues, but we don't know very much about them. However, there was a study in 2017 that sort of looked at how could you improve efficiency in the system. And basically they identified that 28% of cases were above the median uh, average length of stay. And in the public sector, that was 80%. In the public sector, 
you don't get paid whether they stayed. You get paid whether they stay a day or eight days and whether they are readmitted or not is really not an issue because there's not enough data to know what's going on. So they know how many days people stay, but they don't know what the quality of those days are or what that means. Um, there's a sense, there's evidence that in the private sector, 5% of total inpatient days are due to avoidable readmissions. So, but that's partial data. Increased hospital safety. Adverse events is something that is not recorded. So this is based on a sample and they estimated what the cost was. So it's about, um, let's see, this is, I put this in dollars instead of in, in dollars. So it's about two to um, seven billion, depending on the exchange rate. So they increased patient days by almost seven days. So that's quite significant. And reducing uh, hospitalizations in the private sector uh, would, be an, uh, would be an improvement in quality. And it accounts for 23 per day. Total inpatient days are um, unnecessary. So combined, if they could fix these, the waste in the system would be reduced by 42%. So this gives you a sense from limited data, but a very carefully done study of what the problems really are in terms of quality. And this is, and it's also a problem of efficiency. So the, this has been, this is, a, this is a study that was also cited in the World Bank study that the government listened to, and, but the government keeps changing <laughs> as, as, as do ours. So we're quite sympathetic about it. But anyway, it gives you a sense of the, the issues with quality even though the data collection is quite, quite limited. So, <clears throat> so the, the, the weaknesses of the public system is that the responsibilities at every level are fragmented and they almost compete. There's a lack of autonomy at the, at the local level. There are a lot of requirements. Requirements as opposed to regulations, which are slightly different. There are rigidity in the rules. There's no quality culture. There's low productivity, but in public systems, we find this all over the world because there's a lot of absenteeism, a lot of leaving early, coming late. Um, and there, because there's no oversight of performance and no authority of the people who oversee performance, you see this as a problem. And data systems are really nowhere, which is really odd because Brazil is actually a very connected country. They, they started paying electronically for, for medical services in the early 90s, but they're just, they've really sort of let that go. And finally, which is a big problem, is public and private sectors are completely separate. They don't talk to each other, they don't work together. And a lot of these things really drive private insurance and private spending because it's a hassle to deal with these, with these issues. So let me switch to the private sector. So it's the largest private insurance sector in emerging markets. Um, insurance and providers uh, target all income segments and it's very interesting the kinds of things that have evolved that I will talk about. There are 16 health insurers have over 500,000, only, only 16 have over 500,000 enrollees. And that's a problem because you have a lot of small companies that are, are um, vulnerable, but from a, and I'll, I'll talk, to the, uh, a talk about the regulation and the regulations on the financial side is quite good. And there is an entry before countries, uh, before companies go, go, go uh, bankrupt. So managed care has become very common in many very creative arrangements. All, all forms of insurance and provider payer structures are regulated by an independent federal regulator called the agency, the National Agency for Supplementary Healthcare. It's a very odd term. And the reason it, the reason it is called that, in 1988, they had a new constitution and they decided that the government was going to provide all healthcare. And then if people wanted supplementary care, they could get it very much along the lines of the way the UK has seen uh, private healthcare, which is a supplement to what they provide. It hasn't worked out quite the same way in Brazil, but the ANS is a very serious and very capable agency. And um, they, do, they do a lot of, they, they provide it, they collect very good data, they know what's going on. So as I said, the private health insurance market is one of the largest globally. Almost 50 million people are covered which is 23% of the population, which is down by about two to three percentage points from a few years ago. My guess that from what I understand is probably going to be going up because more people are concerned about not gaining access to the public, public hospitals that were overrun under COVID. Um, so 27 million people have dental insurance, 
which has become a major industry um, in only since about 2000. Um, it's a $105 billion market and there are 56,000 insurance suppliers. As I mentioned, this is, this is um, fragmented and there are 718 managed care organizations. So it's pretty, it's quite large. So this gives you a sense of where the coverage is across states. And so those that are more than 20% are Rio de Janeiro state, Sao Paulo state, inside Goyas, it's a green box, which is the, the capital of Brasilia. And Espiritu Santo is a, is a spillover from Rio. So those are the big ones. But what's really remarkable is the, the gold cover with gold colored states, which are quite poor and have had a big surge in insurance coverage, mostly in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. And the growth in the other states is, is, um, is also quite, um, has, has accelerated. So you have a very large, you have, a, well, just, just to give it perspective, Amazonas and Pará up in the North is the Amazon and you still have a lot of coverage now. That's because it's coverage in cities and there are two major cities in those states, more than two, they're, they're a handful, but they're big and they use health, private health insurance. So I think that's important because that drives private sector demand. So what are the characteristics of the private health insurers? So on the left-hand side, there's a pie, cart, pie chart and the HMOs and managed care is quite significant. And so are the physician cooperatives, which is a, form, which is a bit of a form of a managed care uh, arrangement, but it's owned and run by physicians, which has some conflict of interest, which has caused some problems. And they have, they're like a franchise. So corporate in-house services is not insignificant and then contract out services. So it's a, it's a, um, it's very, it's, it's varied, but the HMOs in the, in the um, physician cooperatives really dominate. And then on the right-hand side, there are the annual spe premium spent on private health, health insurance which have been going up steadily um, since ANS was founded in 2001. So does somebody want to ask me, I mean, let me go through this slide and then I will, I think I will ask for questions because I've been going lickety split through this. No, no, you're fine, uh, Maureen, we can- uh, Is that okay? You, you can address them at the end. So it's okay, okay. we can address them. Okay. So private health insurance, this, the type of service coverage and cost distribution, so on the left-hand side, we've got the type of service. So ambulatory and hospital is um, second only to ambulatory only. And the corporate health, health plans dominate, which is not surprising. This is what we find in most countries, including in the US, where the, the, where the company health plans play a role. And, they're, um, and that's true for all three of the different, the different kinds of plans. And on the right-hand side, basically the medical care spending, not surprisingly, is heavily on inpatient and diagnostics. Outpatient visits is a little over 12%. So it's very much of a, of a secondary and tertiary healthcare um, system. And it's many, some people, there, there, there are, there are often in many of these plans, there are um, ceilings on how many days you can stay in the hospital. So people play, play, play the insurance as, it, as they need to based on what is covered and what, what kinds of limitations there are. So this is the annual revenues of private health insurers. So it's been, again, it's a re relatively steep curve. It has also meant the premiums have gone up very consistently because there has been largely a of a perception that if costs go up, all the insurance companies need to do is to charge more. And that is becoming a little bit more um, challenged. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But that has always been the view. And the, and the premiums have gone up very dramatically over the past five or so years. So this gives you an idea of some of the innovative practices of and the selected and some selected private providers. These are some of the biggest providers. And I will talk about some of them now after we go through this. But I think what's interesting is the two indemnity uh, services are the, Brade, the third and fourth, the Bradesco Health and Sul America, which have already have, 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 have a fee-for-service model and have been loath to change that. 
and they uh, and um, Emil, which is United Health Group, which is right above it, has come into the market and has shaken a number of things up because it has um, changed the, the, the way that things are done. So they've been much more of an integrated care model because they're an HMO. They have done quality measurement. They've used IT extensively. They've been very efficient for patients. They've, been, um, they've used IT performance measures. And that has been quite important because they are one of the large, they were one, they were one of the, well, they still are, but they were the largest managed care company before United Health Group bought them. And United Health Group has improved their management and made it a much a stronger from a management point of view. Um, the Unimed, uh, which is halfway down on the left, it is a one of the a physician cooperatives. It has done a lot of innovative work with a group that I will discuss called DRG Brazil, interestingly enough. And they've experimented with case-based payments and with try, it, using IT and in managing their patients as a population as well as individuals. It's, and it's been really helpful for them. They've become very efficient and you could see it in their, their earnings. Hapvida is a really interesting company. It was started in one of the poorest states in the Northeast. It's sort of like a health, uh, an HMO that starts in Mississippi and then grows up north and west to um, serve a larger population. They have, they have grown exponentially. It's been quite remarkable. And they, their, their target market has always been lower the the just barely the low income who can afford, afford some kind of insurance. And it's now expanded into the middle class, but it's, it's been really a lot of those expansions in the Northeast that I showed on that map of Brazil, they've led a lot of it. Prevent Senior is a fascinating company I'll talk about in a moment. They are, it's only for seniors. In Brazil, if you have health insurance, your health insurance basically becomes unaffordable by the time you are in your early 60s. And those who are working and have insurance coverage do not have it once they leave. And their, op their option is to belong to the single unified system. And many do not wanna do that for any number of reasons. So Prevent Senior came in for that reason. And I'll talk about that later. Intermedica has been incredibly creative. They started off dealing with some of the lower middle class communities and providing both managed care and other forms of services. They've integrated care. They've done a lot of very interesting things and they have just uh, done some mergers with some major companies. Dr. Consulta, I will talk about. It's an outpatient service, very new, uh, geared to low income populations and to serving them with timely and integrated care, which the public system cannot do. Um, and then there are the Anape hospitals who are the highest end hospitals. They, are, they do quality measure. They are starting to do IT. They don't yet do claims analysis, but they, do, they are starting to realize that all of these things are things they must do. And frankly, when those hospitals start doing things of that sort where they become more more managerially astute, then other hospitals start to look. So they are the leaders in the field and they will have an impact on the public hospitals as well. So that just gives you a sense of sort of the high end of some of, some of the creative groups. I'm now gonna talk, I'm going to, you know what, I'm, oh, this is what I was missing, this, this, this slide. So if you want, if we want to look at, I had mentioned that the Medica had grown a great deal. So between 2018 and 2020, they grew by 60%, mostly through takes, takeovers. But they now are um, one of the largest, they have one of the largest percents of the market with, and they have over 3 million beneficiaries. And then you have the Unimed, the Unimed Central, which is the physician cooperative, which has almost 4% as the Sula Medica, which is the indemnity insurance. So what I think is interesting are the companies that have lost. It's interesting how Mail has, and I, and I can't tell you why. That's because they had grown up until this point 
And Bradesco help, it help is an indemnity insurance. And I think they will take a hit over time because their model is costs go up, we pay the costs, fee for service, and we just pass on the costs. And so after a while, there are too many, there's too much competition in the system that is offering opportunities. So I think this gives you the sense of uh, the, the top uh, health, uh, seven health insurers, insurers in Brazil. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some of these companies because I think that these are a really interesting way to get a sense of what people are doing. And as the CEO of Prevent Senior said to me, he said, most of the people in Brazil, most of the health managers in Brazil don't understand what we do. And I think that's actually correct. It's a very patient-centered organization. They have outpatient clinics all over Sao Paulo, which is where they started, in the wealthy, basically the middle and upper middle class parts of the, of the city. And because Brazil is aging at about the same rate as the US, they've had the same fertility rate for the last 35 years. They are, a lot of people are retiring and they need some form of health insurance. Very much based on primary care, and they are very efficient at dealing with patients, something that is not very common in most Brazil's uh, uh, healthcare provider system. Uh, they have integrated comprehensive IT and data systems. They use them, they work with their physicians. They are very efficiency driven. They have electronic health, uh, health records that are at every single outlet. And they have, um, they have a team structure, coordinated patient care, just in time clinic could back up. And remember, you have to be 50, 50 years or older to belong to, 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 to be, become a member, to, to, to get a policy from them. So it's a model of care that emphasizes integrated care, prevention, incentives, and strong management. And quite frankly, their hospitals are their weak point, but they have found that where the demand, and they, and they have stratified patients. So they have a particular group that deal with those over 90. So they're very much geared to their, their um, clients and to that, that, that patient base. So that's been, I, I found them one of the most interesting com companies that I've, I, I've worked with in Brazil. There's actually a Harvard bus business case um, about them. So this Unimed in, in uh, Belo Horizonte that I meant before, which is in Minas Gerais. This is the third largest city in Brazil. So it's a physician-run cooperative and they pioneer pay for performance programs in their network starting in 2005, which is, was unheard of in Brazil. Pay for performance is something that's starting to be discussed. They're the first health insurance to apply DRGs to management and they have become very sophisticated at this. Uh, and they have, they have, they're different than their other Unimed because they are so management driven because management and healthcare don't go hand in hand in, in Brazil in many cases because most of the provide, most of the managers positions and most do not have management training. So being able to deal with data, being able to deal with management, deal, dealing with HR is not something that is so common and was never considered important. But the, I think the influence of the US is part of it, but also they've become more, in, more sophisticated as a country in many ways. So the Hup Vita that I mentioned before, it's, it targets the lower middle class and has, it's been in the poorest states. And it's now built a hospital in one of the wealthiest cities in the Southeast. And they have their own network of hospital clinics and emergency. They have fully uh, integrated electronic health records. And they like Prevent Senior know what their providers are doing. Most have no idea. That's not what they, that they don't understand the necessity of doing that. So information systems don't include that. But they do at Hot Vida, and they do in, in most of the companies I'm talking about here. So patients can follow, they can use their phones to, uh, to make appointments, which it's a very, everyone has at least one phone. And it's in, in Brazil is very electronically savvy. They take on to this very, very, they took on to electronics very, very quickly. So there's a big focus on quality. A dedicated team reviews all surgical standards using electronic analytic platforms. It's, again, it's, it's not the typical approach in, in Brazil. So Dr. Consulta, I think, is one of the, it, this is sort of a very Brazil 
and it would be, it would be applicable in many cases in, in many countries. So it's a chain of one-stop shop outpatient clinics with on-site lab, diagnostic, and specialty care. If you go to the public clinic, you can't be seen that day. You have to make an appointment. When you come back, you can have you can have a con consultation, but you can't have a diagnostic, and you have to go somewhere else. They often get lost. They get out of date. It's a problem. So frustrated people who are of the lower uh, lower income earners go to the consulta. So they're located in poor neighborhoods and in the high end neighborhoods where those same people are employed, and they can go to either of the, um, the places near home or the places near work, and they can get, they have continuity because they keep records for them. So it's largely fee for service. They do take insurance, but it's a, it's a fee for service uh, structure. Most of it is out of, out of pocket in their flat rate fees. So online patient portal for patients for results and feedback, again, something the public sector does not have. They harness the, uh, the AI and cloud to manage costs and supply chain, and they're moving towards utilizing machine learning algorithms and predictive analytics. Again, a new concept in Brazil, but really fundamental to being efficient. And it's very fast growing, low cost, high volume, and it's focused on accessibility and affordability, which again, it's not a patient-centered health system for the most part. So this is, Dr. Consulta, I think is one of the most innovative uh, programs and initiatives that I've seen in Latin America in general. And then finally, DRG Brazil is also indicative of the creativity that you find. They basically built everything going to the CMS DRG website and figured out their algorithms. And they have built up a, a capacity for quality assurance and management data, analyzing DRGs. Many of the big hospitals have DRGs, but they don't do claims analysis. They simply use it to get some data about their patients. So they have raised performance, reduced cost, improved outcomes for service delivery of their, their, of their clients. And now they're working with the government. But again, that, some, that tends to be a fit and start kind of thing as governments change so frequently. But it's the only reliable source of national data on performance costs and adverse events. They are the source of the data for the data that I presented on adverse events. So they are really a cutting edge company for Brazil, looking at the future and helping the hospitals and the insurers deal with problems that they should be integrating to, to improve quality and reduce efficiency. I'm sorry, to increase quality and reduce efficiency and improve efficiency. Okay, so I wanted to just end on um, something about COVID because it's on everybody's mind. So Brazil has had one of the largest numbers of cases recorded. They've had 20 million cases. They've had 585 deaths, 85,000 deaths, and it's 2,827 per million population of a death rate. I mean, they have been really hard hit. And they've been hit, they, they, a lot of press about Amazonas, but also in Salvador and Rio and Sao Paulo and all of the major cities. It has been a major hit. And yes, the government has been part of the problem. They have a president who's um, denying the problem and all of the things that go along with denying something that's happening to the country and is right in front of you. They now have a health minister who has some sense of urgency in getting vaccines and has been dealing with the masking problem, wears masks everywhere and is sort of trying to change the, the culture. But the whole COVID-19 has made the public sector rethink healthcare policy. They've not, they've, they've, there's been a discussion with them for many years about changing the way the public system works and the fact that they needed to talk to the private sector. And I think that's sort of something that is now to, on the agenda. And um, I think one of the things that was quite stunning was that despite the fact that they ran out of beds in the public sector, they refused to pay the private sector to treat patients because they said they were too expensive. I'm not sure what that means, but that's a perception of the public sector. And the demand for private cover coverage is expanding again. And you know, if you're already paying, spending 58% in the private sector, the idea that there is one single unified public system is really at odds with reality. The other thing that's happened, which is true in the US, it's true worldwide, is that telehealth is here to stay. Like in the US, 
COVID moved the agenda forward um, in a matter of weeks that would, that would have taken years without COVID. And so, and the issue in the public sector of IT uh, is on the agenda and better aligned with the private sector is something that at least is being discussed. Uh, it really makes no sense to have two parallel systems that don't interact. And especially when the government can't meet demand in a crisis, if any time, that's when you see it. And the other thing that's happening in the private sector is these issues of efficiency and value-based healthcare in particular are an expanding theme. And there's very much a discussion all over uh, the medical community that we have to go to value-based care. It's not always fully understood, but it does bring in the issue of quality, measuring quality, having an IT system and doing management. And those are really important for going forward. So that's sort of the, that's the direction. And that's, I think, what um, many of these innovative companies will be on the front, on the front lines to move the agenda forward. So um, thank you very much. And I'm really open and interested in having your questions. Thank, thank you, you Maureen. Thank you. That was uh, actually a fantastic overview because I think you touched upon so many of the uh, key elements. Um, it, for those of us who want to learn uh, some of the fundamentals. And so I think it also given us some time to have a healthy discussion. So um, what I would, uh, I, I can manage that so you don't have to worry about fooling around with the chat. Maureen, I'll, I'll ask a question and, and from whom and, and uh, most, but not all of the attendees, I think uh, um, I know personally. So the first question is from uh, our senior global consultant, Dr. Jorge Goldberg. Dr. Jorge um, is a practicing physician, but also works for Cedar sinai uh, uh, sort of leading our Mexico City office. And, our, and so he, he comes from Mexico City. He's asking a question, does the private health insurance in Brazil cover international medical care? So for, for patients to travel outside of Brazil and, and how much, in, in, so, in so much as you know about this topic, um, what are the sort of uh, parameters by which that happens in general? So this is a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to, partly because and, and, and so the pattern in, the U, in, in Brazil is that because you probably know about Albert Einstein, which is considered the best hospital in Latin America, and they can do most things. So most of the travel outside, I'm, trying, I'm thinking about this as I'm talking, has been largely um, on people's own uh, finances. But there may be there may be some exception. There are exceptions for executive policies of Bradesco and Sul America. I don't know for so many others. So there is a certain amount of it, but it's only for executive policies, and it's not so. It's not very common, but it, they do have it there. But they don't. They don't. But most others do not. And because a lot of them are managed care uh, arrangements, they use their network and. It's interesting, many of the policies will say, okay, you can use all of the hospitals except these very high-end hospitals, Albert Einstein being one of them. If you have the next level of policy, you can, you can have the, you can have the, uh, you can get at these very high-end hospitals. So there are lots of flexibility and there's lots of variability. So the answer is yes, you do have, but it's not very common. Yeah, so I, I'm guessing, so there's a correlate, Bronia, who works with uh, Jorge in, in our office in Mexico, is sort of asking, do Brazilians, I guess, let, let's take this from a cultural perspective, do they look for medical attention outside of Brazil? As far as you know, is that something, it's, it sounds like it's not very common, what you said. Oh, I don't know, I mean, I think, well, so Albert Einstein works with a lot of people from the U.S., um, and they have connections that they've, that they have, they have exploited. Some of the other, many of the others do not. I mean, Emil obviously has that ac that access because it's United Health Group, uh, and um, they do look to the U.S. and I think with good reason. The U.S. is the, it's more like the U.S. than any other system, right? It's got a very large private sector. It's got a public sector, but it's and the public sector eventually needs to become a payer, and that's just hasn't been on the agenda. But I think for the providers they do know that if people are sick and they really don't have anywhere else to go, they don't, they usually don't go anywhere but the US. 
partly because you have Albert Einstein and you have a couple of other big hospitals. Yeah, yeah. So, um, can I just add one thing to that? A lot of people, from a clinical point of view, a lot of Brazilians are belong to international associations of clinical groups, as they do in Mexico. So that's very common. So anyway, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's cool. That's very cool, actually. So the next question is going to come, I believe, from a mutual friend and colleague of ours, Juan Carlos Negrete. And so because Juan Carlos is a, is a bra another brainiac, I think I'll, I'll read it directly because... So if I understood correctly, healthcare is enshrined as a right in the Brazilian constitution. Then are shortcomings in access and therapeutics addressed by the judiciary like in Colombia? If so, does it have an impact in the overall country's health um, expenditure and who pays for it? It was a great presentation. So that's Juan Carlos question and comment. Of course, he had to roll in Colombia into it. So go for yeah. it. No, well, Juan Carlos is absolutely right. Uh, so the, there are two countries in Latin America where the courts are deciding who can get care outside the country. It's Brazil and Colombia, and they both are in a wrangle with the courts. One of the things that's happening in Brazil is the, the health care system itself, the private system in particular, but also the public, is going to the courts to try to educate them, to explain to them why they have said, no, you cannot get care outside the country. So, I mean, does everybody understand what he's talking about? Probably not. Why don't you frame okay. it a little so, bit? Okay, so what, what happens in Colombia and in Brazil is that, you know, you have somebody who's very wealthy and they go, okay, well, I need this advanced cancer treatment. The public sector can't provide it. So I'm going to um, Houston, I'm gonna have it and I send the bill to the government and the government has to pay for it. Because in both countries, um, universal coverage is enshrined in the constitution, the courts have said, well, of course this is covered. And they side on the side of the patients. And this has been a big issue in both countries uh, because it ends up costing a fortune and only some people do it, but still it's, it's a significant amount of money. And because what you pay in the US and what you pay in Brazil are quite different. Uh, the, I mean, it may be expensive in Brazil, but it doesn't compare to what you pay in the U.S. So um, does it have an impact in the overall college, country's health expenditure? Yes, in the sense that you're having to siphon off this amount for, uh, for it, and the government has to pay for it because the courts have sided with them. So yes, this is a problem. Um, yeah. that's, the pro that's the idea of when you, when you enshrine something in a constitution that feels good, but you don't think about the financing. Thank you for framing that. It's actually a great, great topic. And, um, you know, we deal with that in a less, in a different way with some of the Gulf countries. And there, you know, it's different, obviously, uh, the GCC countries, because the government does have a budget and does proactively send their patients to around the world for health care. Um, and a lot of times it'll come the back end like that. But I haven't heard, you know, it's not done so formally, legally, but there are issues in that. So I, I think, um, you know, uh, what I'm going to, there's another question here, but I'm going to use this topic of something you just said to kind of get your opinion on about what fold difference is, if you were to just to take a stab at it, and I bet if we research it, we get the number, the difference in healthcare costs per unit of whatever, you know, so so I've been really fascinated with the Big Mac index recently. And so I was traveling in, in, in uh, Russia, Turkey, and Georgia. Mm -hmm. and tried to do the same thing, tried to do the same thing with like a coronary artery bypass. And believe it or not, in those countries, you might be between eightfold and almost a hundredfold in difference in, in the price of a procedure versus the United States. Absolutely mind boggling. What is it in Brazil? Can you give a, contextualize it? Is it twice on average, in your opinion, one and a half, five, well, I mean, you have to, the, the reason the U.S. is so expensive is providers have paid a lot more than they are in any other country, including in, in, in Europe. So if you compare the U.S. costs to Europe, they would also be higher. So what is the difference? Oh, probably tenfold. I mean, just to pick a number, it's just that people are not paid, providers are not paid as much. The, amount, the, the extent of diagnostics and treatment is not as broad or, and when it is quite broad, it doesn't include everyone. Only some people get access because some of the highest end 
goes to either the highest end public hospitals, like in the rest of Latin America, or to the high end private. And the U and in Brazil, the high end private is taking a good deal of that um, of that market. And it's partly because some of these these um, this machinery basically is so expensive and they can get insurance to pay for it, but the government isn't sure that it wants to. So that's, there's a, there's a tension there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so um, another question, uh, this comes from Tanya Yuba and she is asking, and she's throwing the, the, the P words out there. What is your perspective on the public private partnerships and other innovative financing models given the impact of the pandemic? So PPP models. Well, so, regardless of the pandemic, I think these are the future. The country that does it best is Brazil, interestingly. There's mm. a, let's see, 30 year experiment with PPPs where you have quality measures, you have contracting out, but it's only in Sao Paulo state. It's 30 hospitals. They're very popular. And this is something that was, I think, quite amusing was when they put their first one in one of the socialist communities that Lula um, ran for all intents and purposes, they were vehemently opposed to it and they were picketing and they opened the hospital anyway. And about three years later, that same group came to the state of Sao Paulo and said, we, wanna, we want one of those hospitals that you built. And they said, well, we thought you didn't like them. They go, well, but our constituents do. Could, could we do one of those? So they're very popular. They're, they're not there. Well, people talk about them, but a, a PPP, as they've set it up in Brazil and they've set up in very few other places successfully, you've got to have a lot of oversight. You've got to know what you want. You've got to have incentives. You've got to pay on time. You've got to do some very specific things that Brazil has been very successful at doing, but very few other places have. I think implicit in your in your your question though is is the government going to start paying the private sector to provide care? I think it will come, but it's a very very strong ideology in Brazil. It is in much of Latin America, but it's I think the strongest and really strong in Brazil that the private sector is evil, and the same people who will tell you that it's evil use it. So it's a little bit of a a little bit of ideology and a little bit of practice that get get a little bit mixed up. So, but I think that your point is really well taken and I think that's the future. Thank you, thank you. So um, Ben Sayo has a great question. I'm gonna save that because I think that's a good to, to towards the end, but um, Ray Lu, who were, I, and I apologize if I get it wrong, but uh, Ray is an architect, but he works at our facilities and helps us a lot, especially in our China projects, but elsewhere. He has a question bringing you back to sort of the core, your core expertise and areas you touched upon, which is how do you think population health issues are going to unfold in the Brazilian healthcare market? And I guess the, the idea there, at least if I were to um, spin that further, is how is it similar, dissimilar to what's happening in the U.S. and how can we project a common understanding? Um, you know, it's... I think one of the things that, I mean, the US, as I say, the US and Brazil have a lot of things in common. And we've always, we've had a very hospital centric uh, model and so have they. And the idea of integrated care is, is starting to be discussed. And because a lot of these um, managed care companies are doing something about it, I think is, is an example, but I think that, and that's really where I think the population health initiatives come in, because then you have empanelment, and then you have you have physicians that physicians and nurses that 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 uh, track track patients and know what's happening. One of the big problems in Brazil, and this is true in many many countries, is there are not enough nurses. The nurses are just barely they're like two 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 or three to one for nurses to doctors, which is way off from what we do in the U.S. And under law, nurses are not allowed to do certain things because the doctors were afraid of losing control. But now we're trying to make the point that you need to set the agenda and they need to implement. And that transition is hard, uh, but it's being discussed. It's just slow. Um, so I, I think that they're behind the US in terms of thinking about this and are doing things. But the other thing I think that about Brazil is that they're, they're quite adaptable and Again, very much like the US, something new, we can do something, okay, let's do it. But I think one of the shortcomings is that there's not enough um, 
there are not enough managers. So you've got nurses and managers who are in short supply. Maureen, you may have you may have mentioned this, but I want I I didn't get exactly in the the hospital CEOs in Brazil. I presume they have a fairly robust association. Um, are they yes. almost primarily administrators? How many are physicians or nursing background? I think you touched on it, but I'm sorry if you did, but I, I, my, I had a question about that. My sense is the vast majority. The vast majority are, are hospital administrators. No, the vast majority are, are physicians. Physicians, yeah. yeah. Okay. We've taken some, some courses, uh, yeah. but um, you know, and some physicians have done what has happened, has happened in the US too, where you have a physician running a hospital and it became a disaster because the management went awry. But you know, I think that happens in every country. I don't think it's unique to Brazil. And they, and you know, they, they're, they're having a difficulty understand, you know, to, and this is, again, this is not unique to Brazil, of realizing that there's a real bonus to having managers, that the, that the, the physicians are not gonna lose control of the clinical care but they feel that they're losing control. And so it's slow. And we see this in many countries. You see it in Turkey. You see it, you see it, you see it in Colombia. You see it in a lot of countries. And it's, it's, um, it's an evolution. But again, I mean, the question of, you know, do countries look to other countries? And yeah, I mean, I think the private sector in most of the world looks to the U.S. and say, okay, what is the U.S. doing? Because it's a big, and in Latin America in particular, because it's close. And, you know, um, one, of the pro one of the other problems in Brazil which is less of a problem in a Colombia or a Mexico is that very few people speak English. Yeah. Right. And that's, and, but people who don't learn to read and these people who this DRG Brazil, who learned how to do DRGs by, by learning the algorithms and CMS. I mean, they don't speak English, but they can read it and they can, they get the data, right. They get the numbers, right. So, you know, this is sort of, doing a, 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 a mishmash of things to sort of cobble together something that makes sense. Well, it's certainly a problem for me because I don't speak Portuguese and I wish I, I did. And that actually is a nice segue to Ben's question because fundamentally it's, and Ben is a director of our global business development. And, mm -hmm. and he's saying, you know, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, given the current trends in Brazil, what opportunities do you see for US Brazil hospital collaborations? And I wonder why there's not more of it. Uh, is, it the, is it that they perceive themselves as competent or so competent? Is it the language, culture? I don't know. What is it? What do you think? Language is part of it. Um, I think also, but you know, in Brazil, it, well, it used to be that um, Brazil looked to France and wanted to be uh, like France. And that was their touchstone. And that has shifted to the U.S. And then if you look at where wealthy Brazilians go who cannot get what they need locally, they go to the US. So I think they're very keen on having connections. And if you have been, if you have trained at one of the US universities, it gives, or one of the medical centers, it gives you cachet, it gives you, you know, a, a, a leg up on everyone else. I think hospitals haven't really done much, although one hospital had has had a relationship with Sloan Kettering for probably 25 years, and that gives prestige to the to the to the hospitals. I mean, they are all all of the major hospitals are JCI accredited. So the next demarcation that that makes them different is making a linkage with an American hospital where they can say, you know, this is a world renowned hospitals, and they are our affiliate. So I think there is potential. I don't think it has been really pursued very, very much, but I think it has potential. I think right now things are settling down after COVID. And I think there's going to be over the next year, some readjustment of many things having to do with insurance as well as providers, because there's been a real shock to the system. And you know, the, as a death rate, they have one of the highest death rates in the world. And it's had, it's had an impact. And so that, that settling, I think will, and, and you can't drive, you can't go to Brazil. I have not been to Brazil in two years, which is a record for me. And it's because they've closed their borders and Brazilians can't get out and no one can go in. So anyway, but I, but to answer the question, I think there is potential. I think it hasn't really been tapped very much. And probably Albert Einstein has been the country and Cedar Libanese have been the two who have tapped it the most, but the others have, 
virtually not, but my sense is where they really, and they want clinical collaboration with it, but they also need the management collaboration. And I think that's, that's, that's where I think major medical centers play a big role. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you, um, we, we have just, a, we have a couple more minutes here, two, three minutes and um, a little bit of a different direction here. You know, if you look at research uh, dollars, so, so funding for research and development, and, and if you look at the biomedical sciences, right, it's so dominated, more than a half of the global funding comes from US, whether it's the government-based or private sector or what have you, in, uh, or uh, foundations. And then you got Western Europe, you have Japan, and you know, where does, so obviously Brazil is not, a, a, I take a big chunk of that, and, uh, but it's amazing for a country that's that dominant, you know, if you look at both its, you know, its size, land, population, and also its, its wealth, ought it not be, and is it growing like China, rapidly growing in, in expenditure, research, and bringing new technology innovations? Okay. This is a really this is a really good question, and I didn't touch on it, but I probably should. Brazil has a powerhouse of researchers, um, biomedical and other. Um, under COVID, they realized that they didn't have a, a, a level four lab in Latin America, and they immediately went to Brazil because they had the infrastructure to be able to do it. They had the quality control. They had the people. It they they have been training researchers and sending them out overseas for decades. And they have a lot of depth uh, and very careful, very careful researchers who, a lot of them have been trained or have been do, have done um, some of their training in the U.S. or in Europe. So they have some really first-rate people on government funding. Yes, government does fund this. It's mostly domestic, not surprisingly. If you look at the different per capita GDP, you can see that you know if they're a, a tenth of ours, they're not going to be funding research at the level the U.S. does, but they are very committed. And under, there's a lot of discussion in the post-COVID world of, of, have, of linking research laboratories and research, and Brazil is front and center in that. I mean, there's no question. It's sort of like South Africa. It's like um, Thailand, South Africa. There's certain countries that have, India, that have really invested in researchers and research capacity and the government funds some of it domestically. So they would be a fantastic partner on the research side. Thank you, thank you. I wanna thank you for a wonderful presentation. Juan Carlos, I noticed you're on the panel. I don't mean to call you out, but if you wanted to make a comment or say hello, <laughs> the, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, hey, Tam. And Maureen, what a great presentation. Uh, if, if, if you allow me to, to, to rob some of your slides to share with my students, I would love to. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can do that. And by the way, the, co the, the, uh, the cover slide is a Mexican hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Just Great. so you know. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks to all who joined uh, in the middle of this Friday. And um, thank you, Maureen, again, for uh, enlightening us and educating us on a very important topic. So everyone have a great weekend. Wish the best for the Baltimore Ravens. We got a big game Sunday night. Take care. All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye.